Hi, and welcome to another episode of Rational Actors. I'm Kevin Glass, Managing Editor of Town Hall, and today I am joined by... Uh, David Graham, Politics Editor at The Atlantic. Yeah, thanks for being on with me, David. Uh, I think that we've got some interesting topics to hit on here, and I think first uh, is kind of what was brought up by uh, an article from Jonathan Chait yesterday, which is a theme that's been hit on fairly recently in the Obama years, and it's basically... In, in the course of his explanation of his experience of seeing 12 Years a Slave, which is uh, very critically acclaimed, I haven't actually seen it, but he goes on to say that there is a lot of racial undertones to conservatives', conservatives criticisms of Obama. Um, and I wanted to kind of get your take on that and your take on what might be undergirding some of these uh I guess, criticisms of criticisms of conservatives in the Obama years. <laughs> well, I think one thing that the, the, the sort of meta debate about this column brings out is whether or not there is, in fact, any racial element to what conservatives are saying. Clearly, some people are taking it that way. I think a lot of people on the left are taking it that way. And if nothing else, that seems to be what's I hate to use a phrase like a teachable moment, but like maybe there's something to be, to, to be learned from the fact that we see that obviously liberals are imputing a, a racial motive to all sorts of things uh, that are said about Obama, whether they are or are not or a borderline. That, you know, that's it, it's what they're seeing, I think. And that's that was what I'm seeing from this. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I think that something that's kind of uh, inhibited conservative thinking on, I mean, a lot of structural racism today is mm -hmm. the confusion in our lexicon. So if I... Mm -hmm. If I call someone a racist, what that's popularly understood to mean is that they have an overt dislike of other races or they have an overt thinking that others are inferior or things like that. Um, and that's mm -hmm. not really the kind of racism that we're grappling with anymore. And sure, certainly there are overt racists out there, lots of them. Um, but the kind of thrust of a lot of these criticisms is that it's not mm -hmm. overt racism. It's structural racism. Right. It's deeper than that. Um, so when you say that something normally, and I think that progressives are right about this, you know, that there is a, a lot of, I think Chait called it residue um, from the slavery era that infects our society and how uh, we operate. Um, mm -hmm. But when someone is called a racist or, someone is, or someone's actions or words are called racist, uh, what they immediately imagine they're being called as someone who dislikes black people just by fa the fact right. of them being black. And I think that mm -hmm. that distinction is something that inhibited, inhibits conservatives, conservatives um, thinking and their ability to move forward. Um, but I think it also is something that needs more clarification mm -hmm. when you're making that kind of a, uh, accusation. Sure. So I, I saw something, I think this was you, although if it wasn't, I, I, too many tweets, but somebody was tweeting that the, the structural racism explanation would be a lot more convincing if it wasn't always a you know a conservative case, right? It was only if it it seems like whenever folks like Chait make this argument, it always applies to a conservative pundit or a conservative politician, and never to a liberal. Was that you? Uh, I I might have tweeted some things along <laughs> those lines, but yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of of examples of. I was wondering if you had examples of, of uh, places where it looks like liberals are committing the same error of structural racism. Well, there was a good... Or being blind to it. Right. There was a good uh, post from John Chait in the past that kind of was <laughs> brought up as well, where um, there was, you know, this photo of Obama in the White House early in his, in his presidency where he's kicking back, he's got his legs up on the desk, um, mm -hmm. and someone accused, like, the popularity of this photo of having racial connotations, saying that he's, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the same way that... Chait was accusing Quinn Hillier of, of, of doing this, saying that this was showing that he's haughty or he's lazy or something like that. Right. Um, and I think that it's, well, I think that there are, there are problematic criticisms that some conservatives make of President Obama. Um, but I think that they kind of knee-jerk react into thinking that they're falsely being accused of racism. Um, mm -hmm. in most cases. And sometimes right. that's right and sometimes that's wrong. Um, 
but conservatives kind of do need to realize, well, yeah, conservatives need to realize that there are these structural factors at play. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like you were saying, kind of the asymmetrical aspect of this, um, there was this dust up on um, Chris Hayes' show a while back where mm-hmm. he claimed that, you know, racists are of only one ide- ideological movement in the United States. And I think that that yeah. is a problematic attitude that progressives have. Mm-hmm. That, you know, yeah. not that there are no progressive racists or liberal racists or whatever, but that the problem is so asymmetrical that it's all, that it's not even worth it to address the problem of liberals mm-hmm. who are racists or progressives who are racists. Um, and mm-hmm. that that's the reason that they're kind of calling out all of the conservatives. Mm-hmm. That seems to distract from the, the structural racism problem, too. If you're sort of, if you're, you're focused on picking out who the racists are and, and, and naming and shaming, um, you're probably not really dealing with the, you know, questions like, you know, disproportionate arrest rates or, or whatever, right? You're, you're too busy on a witch hunt. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so, so that, I mean, I see Chayton Hayes are sort of working at cross purposes there, it seems. If, does that make sense? Yes. Um, but I do think that um, conservatives kind of do need to realize, and Tim Carney had a good response to Chait saying that yeah. there are a lot of uh, structural factors at play that conservatives kind of try to brush aside. And I think that mm-hmm. um, when it comes to you know overt versus structural racism here, conservatives tend to think that and actually, this kind of ties into a minor flap that happened when the Republican National Committee over the weekend tweeted uh, about mm-hmm. Rosa Parks' uh, role in, in quote unquote, ending racism. Um, right. And conservatives tend to think that racism is, is less of a concern and maybe not even that much of a concern because there is legal equal treatment under the law. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. that's what conservatives are generally um, focused on, is mm-hmm. kind of legalize is making the law colorblind, uh, and right. that if you make the law colorblind, racism will go away. And if we just mm-hmm. if we and for the most part, we've made laws colorblind. For the most part, I'm not going to make any huge claims there, but um, sure on the major issues, school segregation, for right. example. Yeah. You know. I, yes. Yeah. The civil rights movement equalizes a lot of treatment of the law. Um, and mm-hmm. conservatives think that once you do that, and once you start stop talking about racism, um, it'll go away, which I think mm-hmm. is, a, is a wrong attitude to have about racism. And that it, it needs to be, and conservatives in particular, need to be more proactive um, in combating racism. And, and that might, mm-hmm. that's not necessarily advocate, means advocating for government solutions to racism, but it does mean education or it means conversations or things like that right the other thing that this all brings out that rereading chase column today is is this issue of disaggregation so it is both the case that um there's something pretty problematic about you know referring to a black man as uppity or haughty and also the case that barack obama may be arrogant and it's totally possible to see him as arrogant uh in a way that is not necessarily related to color, right? And since we, we're dealing with a single example of a politician, and there are relatively few, I think, high-profile black politicians, and only one black president, it's hard to separate criticisms that are targeted at Obama specifically from criticisms that, you know, are, are have a, a, a different pedigree. Uh, and I, I think that's why... You, to me, that's one reason there are so many battles over things about Obama and all these semantic battles are, what does this particular sentence mean? What is this writer trying to say? Is it, they say they're saying one thing, but do they really mean this? And I think the lack of much data to go on and, and other examples and sample size makes it, it tough to see. Yes, I think that's right. Um, and I think that conservatives don't take into account the magnitude of the power of, of words and framing and things like that, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, the word uppity, if, if, if someone wrote a column criticizing President Obama and literally called him uppity, I don't think that anyone would have a problem saying that that's incredibly problematic, right. maybe overtly racist, even if that person is not aware of, you know, the stigma around 
calling African Americans <laughs> uppity or haughty or whatever. Um, right. I so I I don't think that conservatives kind of get that. You know, they say that mm-hmm. oh, it's your fault for bringing race back into this. Um, mm-hmm. President Obama is clearly you know very arrogant. So uh, why? Why are you taking issue with this word? But I don't. Mm-hmm. I think for the most part, conservatives are aware of things like that, but they're not aware of um, more kind of structural background issues. I mean, I mean, like uh-huh. President Bush was, or President Bush, I said, oh Bush, um, was <laughs> compared to mon- a monkey many, many times. Uh, right. He would not do that. It would be worse to compare President Obama to a monkey than compare mm-hmm. President Bush to a monkey. Right. Um, and, and occasionally you'll hear people pushing back on that. Well, this is a double standard. It's like affirmative action. It's not fair. Why can't we do one for the other? If, if, it, if it's it's okay for one politician, why isn't it the same? Um, which seems like the sort of, uh, you know, the absurdist reduction of the making the law colorblind and equalizing, right? On the one hand, you have, it, it makes sense for, uh, to, to get rid of segregated, you know, segregation and, and so on and so forth. And, and if you take that, that colorblind all the way across the board, you end up saying, well, if we called Bush a monkey, why can't we call Obama a monkey? Does it, do those seem connected to you? I, I think there's a not. I don't think everybody draws this connection, um, and I I don't think I buy it. But I think there's a you can draw a line between those two things. Right. And at some, I don't I don't know if it will will ever go away. You know. Um, mm-hmm. And at some point, like we all we all recognize, it would be horrendous to call President Obama monkey or uppity or any of the kind of stigmatized things that have gone along with being black in America for mm-hmm. um, for as long as those have been stigmas. Um, mm-hmm. But Che was kind of criticizing Hillier for you not using those exact words, but kind of saying that mm-hmm. that sentiment is where his criticism is coming from. Um, right. And he said, I think he said, you know, Hillier was not aware of how he was cloaking his argument in racial terms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then I think Chait was more problematic in, in, in saying that Quinn Hillier is the, you know, ideological descendant of slave drivers. Right. Um, which mm-hmm. gets, I think that's way too far. I think that saying mm-hmm. that conser- saying that conservatives uh, are unaware of how structural racism still is a huge factor and how... Um, it's important to be more careful about word choices is different from saying they're, you know, the heirs of slave owners, slave owners. So now why do you think conservatives are less attuned to that? Um, certainly it's not for lack of liberals calling racism. (laughs) Right. Um, why? I mean, to a certain extent, they want, they want racism to not be, a factor and they want to mm-hmm. conservatives believe in a merit-based society right where right there's equality of opportunity for everyone mm-hmm. which i would say is not the case but it's an important goal to be working towards right. um but and racism is another thing is a thing that is really hard if not impossible to ever get rid of and will always be a reason to try and um selectively give groups legs up in the you know meritocracy because if it right. if you have a true meritocracy you like to believe that any one of all races um has equal opportunity um right. and racism is something that would inhibit that especially in a country where we have a majority of the people are of one race mm-hmm. i mean to what extent do you think the um you know relative whiteness of the republican party is a problem now or, or not, not, maybe not a problem, but a, a root of that. Right. If there were more black Republicans, do you think more conservative pundits would be more attuned to that? Surely. I'm not sure. Yeah? Interesting. Why is that? Well, um, we see black conservatives kind of used for tokenism, basically, in the Republican Party. Uh-huh. Um, right. And we saw, actually, at, at the 2012 political conventions, there I remember um, people. someone did an analysis of people of color on giving given speaking roles at each mm-hmm. convention and republicans had more they had more mm-hmm. i don't remember if they had more women but they had more hispanics they had more black people right um and to a certain extent when you have someone um like alan west 
who is a black conservative, um, who goes out and and says, um, you know, racism is not a problem, or you know, I don't I don't know if Alan West has actually said these things, but um, sure, someone who says, you know, that the the structural racism that um, Democrats and the culture of victimhood or whatever um, mm-hmm. are not huge concerns. Republicans like to hold that up and say, see, this is why Democrats are wrong about these things. It's different. Right. You get Thomas Sowell saying some of those things, for example. Right. And we actually yeah. see people like Colin Powell, um, who has said many things to uh, distance himself from the conservative movement in the past few years. Yeah. But he says, he acknowledges the difficulties in, in combating racism. Um, and he's more ostracized from the Republican Party for it. Like, that's one of mm-hmm. the things that has distanced himself to, from the Republican Party. It's not something that right. Republicans have um, kind of internalized. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think more black conservatives mm-hmm. in and of itself would um, help the Republican Party in this way. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it seems to me that's another example of sort of the problem of disaggregating because you, you have a conservative white um, liberal black uh, dynamic that, that, although exaggerated, I, I think ends up playing into this. The, you know, the, the, although it's funny looking at this where we have Chait, a white guy, uh, responding to Quinn Hillier, a white guy, and then yeah. we are discussing this. So <laughs> it, it's all a little meta, I think. Yes. But, um, but I think hopefully, you know, we can... I mean, I want the Republican Party to acknowledge, and conservatives in general to acknowledge, that racism is still a thing um, that mm-hmm. needs to be fought about, fought against uh, in modern society. Um, but I also think, so Quinn Hillier wrote a response today that didn't, that was mm-hmm. not well received in my Twitter feed, just generally. Um, but I think that one of the large problems with what Chait wrote and about Mm-hmm. Quinn Hillier in particular, um, is, is kind of identifying them in, you know, this grand racist tradition in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, and, right. it, and that, and that's a problem of identifying what the problem is, right? If you, mm-hmm. if you misidentify the problem, it's harder to get solutions and saying yeah. in the Chris Hayes way, or I don't know if John Chait thinks this, but saying that, you know, this is a problem confined to the other side. Um, I think mm-hmm. that is a huge, that is something holding conservatives back and holding mm-hmm. progressives back. Right. It's hard to see what the benefit is of of make, drawing that distinction. E- even if it were 100% true, I'm not sure what, what benefit you have in saying it's only these guys who are the problem, right? It's, it's a, a team-based approach rather than a um, sort of solution-based approach. I, I'm speaking jargon. But I think that's true, right? It, it, it makes it into a litmus test. It makes it into just a dividing issue instead of actually dealing with whatever the questions are and, and whether or not it's, it's these things are, well, what, the structural racism problems. Right. And to a certain extent, it's, it's kind of used as a cudgel. You say, you know, mm-hmm. you're conservative, you think these things, but you're also on the side of all these racists. Mm-hmm. And yes. to, to that extent, it all, that, plays back into what I started with, which is confusing the kind of overt versus structural racism argument. It says, you know, Mm -hmm. there are all these people who don't recognize what white privilege is in the conservative movement, um, and you're with them, and maybe you're an overt racist because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So do you think we'll get any closer to um, understanding that distinction uh, through this flap? I mean, I would hope so, but... (laughs) These flaps have been going on for a long time, and Mm -hmm. to a large extent, this is kind of just a confine confined to the blogo world. You know, we're not having this kind of larger discussion. And Mm -hmm. I think something that is true, and I've seen written, is that conservatives' attitude on racism has regressed a little bit in the Obama years. Um, And I think Mm -hmm. there are two factors for that. One is that conservatives used the media's hype of how Obama would give us a post-racial society to say, mm-hmm. well, we elected Obama, so now all these racists, all the, all these problems of racism have gone away because that's what you said would happen right. if we elected you Obama. You guys in the liberal media said so. Right. right. Um, We're just taking your metric. Right. 
And I think that the false accusations of racism directed at people who criticize the president, and not that there, mm -hmm. there are many racists who criticize the president and do so in a racist right. way. Um, but not all criticism is racist. But not all criticism is racist. And obviously when you have uh, a black president, uh, there's going to be more there's going to be more people saying you're criticizing him um, because you're a racist when that is not the mm -hmm. case. So not, right. it's not that, uh, it's not like, and, and this is something conservatives think as well, it's not like false accusations of racism are not worse than actual racism. Mm -hmm. But they make it harder to pro <laughs> but they make it harder to progress on the actual issue of racism, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's kind of the problem that the conservative movement has had in the Obama era. Mm -hmm. To grappling with um, which the 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 failing to recognize that false accusations are not as bad as racism, or having to grapple with both. Both. I see. Yeah. Huh. Um. Um. So, you know, what happens then in a post, well, not post Obama, but a post Obama presidency world um, where he's no longer the figurehead of the, the Democratic Party? Does that allow um, uh, sort of more frankness? Does it does it is it help to um, move forward after those regressions? I think the opportunity will be there, certainly. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the the right kind of black Republicans would help. It's not just black Republicans mm -hmm. in general. If we had. 40 right. Allen Wests in the Senate who are Republicans. Um, that would not, I don't think, uh, move the conservative movement forward. I think that mm -hmm. having black conservatives who acknowledge that racism is and will continue to be problems um, push for solutions that aren't necessarily government solutions. But someone who says, mm -hmm. you know, um, structural racism is a problem affirmative action is not necessarily the solution. Um, we need to be more cognizant of this and, and find better solutions. Would mm -hmm. that kind of person identifying as a Republican would be um, helpful for the Republican Party right. for the conservative movement? Right. It seems like a lot, well, I'm trying to think of other examples outside of the, the case of sort of affirmative action where, um, you know, good examples of structural racism where there might be a, a conflict between um, the acknowledgement of a structural racism and, and then the, you know, the ideological goal um, where, like, but I'm, I'm feeling I think of good examples. Like, what are the, what are our other great cases of structural racism that need to be grappled with? I mean, I guess um, the justice system, for example, what would be yeah. a non-government solution to disparate arrest rates or, or disparate sentencing? Right. I mean, and urban poverty in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this actually, we might talk about this in a little bit, but this is kind of related to President Obama's economic speech yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. He made a, a colorblind case for fighting um, right. urban poverty and, and, and pushing for economic uh, opportunity and equality, um, saying that, you know, he, I think he explicitly said, you know, poverty is not a black problem um, in America. Mm -hmm. It's an American problem. Um, right. So there's a lot more to be done there. And and conservatives mm -hmm. would like to say that their, you know, ways of combating poverty and, and helping people up into the middle class uh, are also race blind. Um, mm -hmm. But if if what they're saying is true, it would disproportionately help minorities because right. minorities are disproportionately poor it seems to me that the the um difficulty for many conservatives in acknowledging structural racism uh has tended to seed the policy field on the solutions to the left right so there are conservative solutions and and policies and proposals on a lot of these topics um but there are, um, in the sort of general discourse, because liberals have talked about it more, it's much more clear what the liberal policy solutions are. Right. Um, and and we, you don't get a lot of conversation, so it's hard to even have a debate about what the better solution is if you only have a liberal solution on the table. Right. The only policy I can think of that um, is, a, is sometimes explicitly pushed for on the basis of racial equality is school vouchers, mm -hmm. especially in urban areas, yeah. obviously. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, on which you know conservatives are for giving vouchers to poor 
uh, poor minorities. I mean, they poor people in general, but especially because they're implemented in urban areas, they're going to be uh, even more disproportionately minorities. Um, and that well, and we had this fascinating case of, of Eric Holder versus Bobby Jindal on on school vouchers. Yeah. Just what was this a few weeks ago? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. And that's kind of something that conserv- conservatives I've seen are very comfortable arguing on race grounds when it comes to school vouchers, um, mm-hmm. and basically on every other issue, kind of try to back away from um, the race aspect. Right. Um, I wanted to move now to something less racism, possibly more sexism, um, but Martin Bashir was fired from MSNBC yesterday. Or resigned. Resign, um, perhaps resigned, <laughs> yes. Um, from MSNBC yesterday, based on his comments about Sarah Palin, which seemed off the cuff, I don't, I don't know if they were scripted, whatever, um, mm-hmm but about defecating in Sarah Palin's mouth and how, and Mm -hmm. um, not just that, you know, she's a prominent Republican, um, but she is a woman who Mm -hmm. kind of gets, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's, if it's disproportionately poor treatment by the left. Um, Mm -hmm. And I probably wouldn't say that it's based on her gender, Um, but Martin Bashir might disagree now because he has <laughs> been dismissed based on his Sarah Palin mm-hmm. comments. And I'm not sure that that would have happened if he criticized a man in that way. Yeah. I mean, I'm also not sure he would have criticized a man in that way. I mean, who knows? Hard to tell, but it, it's such a weird comment. It, it's hard to imagine. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, based on no particularly clear, you know, three examples, but just to, on sort of the totality I think Palin does tend to get some of disparate treatment, um, and and she gets um, sort of caricatured as as kind of a ditz. And I I think her kind of word salad sound bites doesn't help. Um, But I yeah I think the the treatment is disproportionate. It's hard to imagine uh, Martin Bashir saying that about Ted Cruz, for example. Yes, it is. Yeah, and you can. I mean, I wouldn't do this, but you can troll Twitter for horrendously sexist <laughs> things said about uh, Sarah Palin. Sure. Um, and those are probably coming from self-identified progressives. Um, right. So, and I, I, I don't know if, the cons- if conservatives at large would get on board with that. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. because like the Chay thing, um, Conservatives would like to say criticism of President Obama um, in many ways, and calling him arrogant, particularly, is not racist. Um, mm-hmm. But is would a conservative say that people who attack Sarah Palin um, call her a ditz, uh, call her a bimbo? Um, are they being sexists in a way that you know they don't? They're not fully appreciating the history of mm-hmm. sexism in America, in which you know women were told. Uh, you're not, your brains don't work on the, don't function on the level of men, so you can't be a leader or a politician or something like that. Mm-hmm. Huh. I don't know. I mean, it's it's weird. I think, in particular, on to hear this coming from a place like MSNBC, which um, makes a, a very visible effort to talk about these sort of things. Um, it, you know, it's weird to see. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure the, the the lack of awareness works as well. I also think that um, the the sort of gender dynamic works. It, it, people's awareness that, of the gender dynamic is different from their awareness of race. Um, since, well, I, I, I think it's it's easy to for people to be um, segregated by race, if not you know legally, just geographically. Right. But that's not and culturally. But that's obviously not true of men and women. Yeah. That's true, and <clears throat> I would I would actually say MSNBC has been consistent. So conservatives went after MSNBC for saying, you know, you mm-hmm. employ these people who say horrible things, and Alec Baldwin was um, similar. He mm-hmm. had a homophobic uh, outburst at I don't was it a paparazzi um, right yeah that came to light, and he was let go from MSNBC. Mm-hmm. And conservatives kind of seized on this to say, hey. 
uh, your standard is if a conservative says something like this, they have to publicly apologize and probably lose their job over it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the progressive standard on, on outbursts like this. And to MSNBC's credit, they followed their own, what, you know, the standard that conservatives said they had. They followed it. They let, mm -hmm. they fired Alec Baldwin. Uh, Martin Bashir resigned. Um, but then we saw conservatives kind of defending. I saw right. conservatives defending, you know. I saw it as well. Uh, Bashir and Baldwin saying that they shouldn't have lost their jobs over their comments. Mm hmm. It's the, I mean, it's similar to, to the, the argument against hate crimes and, and the idea of hate speech, right? You know, we're going to we're going to argue with you and we're going to disagree when you say things like this, but there shouldn't be a ban on it. Right. Um, and I think that's, I think progressives don't always do a very good job of, of defending that and, and, and differentiating between things that are um, maybe deplorable, but, but ought not to mean that you are muzzled or, or disappeared. Uh, I, I think conservatives do a much better job of, of recognizing that difference and, and of defending it. And I think this is a, a great case of that. I, you know, before Bashir resigned, I saw a lot of pretty strident and I think justified criticism of, of the things he'd said. And it was really interesting to see what happened afterwards. Um, and, and I saw the same thing you did of, of a lot of people, a lot of people on the right standing up for Bashir in a way I didn't anticipate. Yeah. And like I said, to MSNBC's credit, they followed the standard. Um, it took them a long time, though. It was a weird, slow-burning scandal um, for the comments to come in, and so far before the, the actual departure, uh, you know, they open themselves up to the risk of looking like they're responding to public opinion more than they are to standards of propriety. Yes. What I actually saw, um, Adam Carolla, he does his own podcast, um, obviously mm -hmm. a Hollywood person, he claimed that it was kind of, oh, it's it was kind of open knowledge that if Alec Baldwin had good ratings, he would not have been fired. But his, mm -hmm. I don't remember how many episodes of his show he had, two or three at most, right? Um, before mm -hmm. he was placed on leave and then ultimately dismissed. Um, right. But if he had, it, that, as far as the entertainment industry knows, they know that you can't survive something like that if you don't have good ratings. And Alec Baldwin did not have good ratings. But possibly sure. he would have survived if, you know, he had rejuvenated the Friday night line up on msnbc mm -hmm. yeah that, that's i mean i i have no insider knowledge but it's it, it makes logical sense it's a lot easier to to fire somebody who's underperforming than somebody who's your star right right i mean look how long it took to fire olderman <laughs> yeah and i mean who, who, a lot of that who didn't make the, didn't do the same it wasn't always the same sort of comments although sometimes he said things that struck me over the line but it was you know he the constant battles with the network and so on and so forth. But, it, you know, it, it took a long time for him to actually get out the door. Yeah. yeah, but he was getting very good ratings, and maybe that's because that's mm -hmm. why it took him a yeah. while. And mm -hmm. it kind of came out afterwards that it was maybe more of a behind-the-scenes thing because he is apparently notoriously impossible to work with or mm -hmm. for or any of that. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, to MSNBC's credit, they did get rid of him eventually, mm -hmm. and... and and they do kind of follow their own standards on what is acceptable to say to keep your job and what's not acceptable to keep your mm -hmm. job. Yeah. It seems weird to me, sort of at, from a branding perspective, to have a channel that has, uh, well, Chris Hayes, for example, and also has Martin Bashir saying things like these. It, it strikes me as difficult to maintain an operation where you've got that kind of disparate uh, types of discourse going on. Possibly. I mean, I would say that Fox News' hosts are more ideologically diverse than they're typically given credit for. I mean, mm -hmm. you have Shep Smith's hour right before Bill O'Reilly's hour, right before um, Sean Hannity's hour. And, I mean, Bill O'Reilly is kind of not on Sean Hannity's level, but they're still, you know, explicitly mm -hmm. conservative commentators. And Shep Smith is pretty much a standard journalist. Right. Yeah, I'm, well, I mean, Bashir, I feel like, as, as we see, is less trying to, to walk the, the straight journalist line or was less trying to walk the straight journalist line. It's more a question of, of you can either build yourself as um, having serious political discussions or you can have this kind of shock jock approach to folks right. like Sarah Palin. 
Um, but it's tough to combine both of those things in fairly short order. Right, yeah. And they've kind of, well, MSNBC in general has kind of transitioned out of the shock jock mode mm -hmm. by, right. I mean, it took, I don't remember who was in that spot before, but, um, you know, they went from Chris Ol or Keith Olbermann in the 8 p.m. hour to Chris Hayes in the 8 p.m. hour, Mm -hmm. um, which is a vastly different kind of show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that probably wraps us up for today. Do you have any last comments? Um, I don't know. I think that probably covers it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks a lot for being on. And uh, tune in next time on uh, Rational Actors. Thanks a lot. Take care.